14th Community Soup Lunch. Please contact Janet if you would like to help. The 25th, we have no choir practice, no potluck dinner, no nothing because the next day is Thanksgiving. The 28th, we can go in the gal um, pardon me, <coughs> Calvary. Uh, Harry says we will have something posted next week for the menu. This Wednesday night, 6.30 to 7.30, practice for the children's Christmas play, which will be December 6th, I believe. The 16th. The 16th. Starting this Wednesday night, 6.30. Uh, Gary would like all SPRC members to meet in the choir room directly after service. Is my mic on? Because I tapped on it. I didn't hear that. It's six, ain't it? I think it's six, Gary. It's, it says the piano mic. I, but it says piano, but I think it's your mic. Yeah. The mic at the piano. Yeah. It should be up a little bit if it's on. Well, it kind of adjusted for me if you can't hear me. Oh, that's the soul. Oh.
the John that plays on page 881 of the Apostles' Creed, traditional version. I believe in God, God Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified. Precious. Precious. I thought precious. I thought he's precious. 
Today's lesson is Mark 12, 38, 44, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Jesus also taught, beware of those teachers of religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces. And how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head table at banquets. Yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers of public. Because of this, they will be more severely punished. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. This is the word of God for we, the people of God.
Thank you, Ginger. After Ginger's message and the scripture reading and then the message from the choir, I think we could probably say amen and go home, but we're not. You haven't heard it all. I think I've shared with you many times how I love to watch people. I can sit and watch people for hours. And as I watch, I play this game in my head where I make up stories about the people I see. And it's almost as if I'm a playwright, but it's backwards. You know, a playwright writes the story and then the actors are hired to hire, you know, play it out. But what I do is I let them play it out and then I write the story. Anyway, I was at the airport last week. You know, I've been doing taxi for George. And I was waiting for him to arrive from a flight on a flight from Chicago. And so I got there a little early, so I picked me a good people watching perch on one of the benches that looked to where the arriving passengers came through. So the gate where they came out from the terminal into the concourse itself. And I, I had a direct shot to see everybody coming in. And it wasn't long before the show started. The first one I saw was this bedraggled traveler, so weary. He shuffled along and was trying to juggle his briefcase and this backpack and a sports coat. And all the while, he had his cell phone to his ear. And he just shuffled along trying to make it in this last leg of his journey. His khakis, I'm sure, at one time were pressed, but they weren't pressed down. And so I decided that he was some weary businessman who'd been gone for a while and he had just landed this huge deal. And he was ready to escape back to the sanctuary of his home. Ready to celebrate by putting his feet up and his lazy board and just relax and chill and leave all that business behind, even if just for a night. And then next up in my parade of characters was this flustered mom. Bless her heart, she had two toddlers in tow. One of them was in a stroller, and the other one was on one of those baby leashes. I know you've seen them. This one, I got tickled though because to try to disguise it from being a baby leash, it was camouflaged as a bare backpack, but it had a leash on the end of it. And I knew better though, and so did the toddler. I wondered who was actually leading who in that group. That poor mother looked to be at the point of exhaustion. She was frazzled beyond anything I could imagine. Well, actually I can because I've been there. And I think that's why I understood her so well. She was at the point of exhaustion where she was probably second guessing this genius idea of flying by herself to come visit her parents in Memphis. But then suddenly, as if out of thin air, appears this huge crowd of people, boisterous folks, probably 10 to 12 people, ranging in age from little bitty ones to people maybe, somebody must have been like 107. And they don't come in from arriving, one of the arriving flights, they come in from the parking lot. They come in that entrance of the airport right there in front of the United Air, the United counter, and they were chattering and they were excited and some held signs and some had balloons. They were obviously gathering there for some type of happy airport reunion. A homecoming maybe because one of the signs said, welcome home. And they were all excited and gathering and you could feel the electricity, but I got tickled because in the midst of all this, I watched this one latecomer come flying up from a different direction, dragging this five or six year old who's hollering. And I decided that that family member, that one, was the one in every family 
that you have to tell to be there 30 minutes before because they couldn't arrive on time if their life depended on it. Probably going to be late for their own funeral. You know them. The airport is the greatest place on earth to people watch. But our scripture reading this morning that Bill shared with us is another incident of people watching. But the setting isn't the airport. Instead, I believe it probably ranked right up there as a great place to people watch, and that was the temple in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem. And it's not just anybody watching, it's Christ himself. But before we jump into the story, let's start with laying some groundwork. So Jesus had just arrived in Jerusalem. It's the week before his death. It's what we celebrate as Holy Week. And as soon as he arrives in Jerusalem, he goes directly to the temple. And that's because the temple there is the center of everything religious. It was the core of who he was. So naturally, that's where he went. And the temple was this place where the people believed that the heavenly world intersected with the earthly world. It was the place, that temple, was where God himself lived. It was the specific place where the divine was believed to be somehow concentrated. And the, the temple itself, maybe you've seen diagrams, was built as if it was a children's stacking toy where the little cubes fit inside each other. It started with a large rectangle, and then a smaller one, and a smaller one, and in the very center was the temple itself. The closer you got to the center, the holier the place was, and the fewer people that were allowed in it. Outside here, on the farthest outskirts there were, was the court of the Gentiles. Anyone who was not Jew, Jewish was allowed in that outer area. But then the next court was the court of the women. And ritually clean Jewish women were allowed in there. And then yet closer to the center was where all the Jewish males could gather. And at the center of that was the temple itself. And then in the inside of that was the room called the Holy of Holies. And only one person could go in there, and that was the high priest. And it only happened one day a year on the Day of Atonement. The high priest would go in there, and inside there was an empty throne for the God that no eye could see would sit upon And tradition had it that the high priest would enter on that one day a year but only after they had tied a rope to his ankle. Because if something happened in there and he should be struck dead, then they had to have a way to get him out because nobody else was allowed in there. Also in this temple was an animal sacrifice system. A great place set up for just that idea that seems so foreign to us today. Sacrificial animals. And then yet there was another function of the temple, and that was they housed a huge food storehouse. And every Jew was expected to contribute to it. And it was believed that it was a redistribution center. It was used to hopefully feed the hungry and the poor and prevent starvation in the event that there was a famine or that if they had been overcome by siege. So this is where we find Jesus and his disciples. They're sitting there near the temple and there are people watching. He watches as the scribes or the religious leaders and teachers strut around in their fine flowing robes, calling attention to themselves, drawing attention to the grand offerings that they make. Sort of reminds me of a 
Banty rooster strutting around in a chicken yard. Look at me, look at me. I can just hear Jesus watching all this go on and go. <sighs> Heavy sigh. So he tells his disciples, beware of the scribes who like to go around in these flowing robes. But why the warning? It's because anybody wearing long flowing robes was somebody who wasn't going to participate in manual labor. It was below them. Because we know that in Jesus' time, everybody made their living by doing some kind of manual labor. So in wearing these long robes, the scribes are instantly telling the public that they are above all that. After all, they're, well, they're scribes. And scribes are so important that they get these special places to sit in the synagogue. And seats with the best view. And at the banquet table, they're at the head table. And everybody can tell by looking at their, where they're seated that they are very important. And so Jesus tells them, People there than his disciples to beware of the scribes. But these same scribes, Jesus goes on to explain to them, are the very ones who devour widows' houses, taking advantage of the widows, even as they're mumbling out these long, wonderful, eloquent prayers. This is another way to say that this was indeed a very corrupt system. It made the rich richer, while it made the poor and the most vulnerable of society even poorer. And so after they had taken all this in, they moved into the next court, the court of the women. And around the walls of this courtyard were a number of trumpet-shaped rectangular containers where people would put their offerings to the temple treasury. And so they sat down and they con continued their people watching. And I bet it wasn't long, like it was for me, that the show began. Along comes a woman, probably shuffling in all by herself. I bet she's not dressed nearly as nicely as everyone else there. Clothes probably tattered, maybe dirty. She's a poor widow. She doesn't hold some fancy velvet purse. Instead, I bet it was some old, raggedy, threadbare little pouch. And I bet she timidly reaches in and almost out of embarrassment, maybe takes those two small coins Two small pieces of copper, because that's all there is in that pouch. And I bet she approaches quietly and humbly. She drops in, dink, one, dink, two tiny coins in that offering box. Well, you know, after all the show that's been going on, that's not very impressive. Especially after you've seen all these large gifts and these flowing robes. Because should the truth be known, those two tiny pieces of copper, each one was the smallest, least valuable coin in use at that time. It was a lepton. That's the Greek word for that coin. We know it as a mite. And each one was worth less than a penny. So she dropped in two of these, big deal. One penny offering. No doubt hers was probably the smallest offering given that day. And I bet the disciples, like everybody else, thought that her cheap little offering didn't amount to much. One small copper coin, half a penny. That second copper coin, one penny total. But in that moment, 
right before their very eyes, a multi-level truth of life is opened up to them. Almost like a living parable. And Jesus seizes that moment. He quickly calls his disciples and he points out the irony of what just happened. The famous Bible words say this, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions, for they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, as poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Now you've heard that, because over the years, many a preacher has used this story as a stewardship sermon preaching about how the widow gave everything, all she had, gave so generously. And there is a sermon there, laying right there on the surface. And if I were preaching a stewardship sermon to you today, I would begin by telling you that studies show that the poorer Americans give a much larger portion of what they have than the wealthy ones do. The wealthy give more dollars, but not proportionately. The lower the income level, the higher the percentage of giving. Now that's kind of startling. But you dig a little deeper, and you find a sharp criticism of the institution of the temple that we were talking about. In spite of everything that the temple was designed and supposed to be, in reality it was something very, very different. This was Herod's infamous temple. And it had that storehouse system I mentioned earlier. And that was a great, noble idea of caring for people in the middle of a crisis, but it was hopelessly corrupt because the temple leaders regularly went in and organized distribution depending on their own interest. If it was in their best interest to give something to someone, they went in, they got it, and they gave it away. And even sadder than that was the unfair tax system that the temple had. It had fallen into a system of favoritism and greed. The tax system was the hardest on the poor of the society. Sometimes the poor were forced to sell everything they had, sell their land, even sell their children into slavery to pay the mandatory temple tax. So for the poorest of poor, this whole thing could be devastating. And in this world that was dominated by men, the most vulnerable were the widows because they were stripped of every right. They were the marginalized of society. They were easy pickings. They were easy victims of this corrupt system. But that's not where the story ends. If you go a little deeper, Jesus pointed out that that woman gave more than anyone else there that day. And here's where the meaning is. Remember, this is Jesus' last week on this earth. He has just a few days before his death, before he hangs on the cross and gives everything he had to live on. He knows that this radical act of self-giving is ahead of him. And so I'm sure maybe as he watches this widow giving everything she had, he can't help but see maybe the gift that he'll be giving, the most radical sacrifice anyone could give. So on the deepest level of this story, I would say that Jesus is the widow in this story offering to sacrifice everything he had. I've shared with you many times that Barbara Brown Taylor is one of my favorite authors. And I think she says it best. It's 
So I'm going to share what she wrote with you. She says, when Jesus leaves the temple with the disciples that day, his public ministry will be over. In four days, he will be dead, having uncurled his fingers from around his offering to give up the two copper coins for life. The widow reminded him of someone. It was the end for her, and it was the end for him too. She gave her living to a corrupt church. He was about to give his life to a corrupt world. She withheld nothing from God, and neither did he. It took one to know one. When he looked at her, it was like looking in a mirror at a reflection so clear that he called his disciples over to see. Look, he said to those who had meant to follow him. That is what I've been talking about. Look at her. And so let's do what Barbara Brown Taylor suggests. Look at that widow. What in the world prompted such radical giving? I'd say that it was the grace and the promise of love and care that God himself can give. It was her un unshakable trust in God's faithfulness. That was the st source of her strength. That's where she got the courage for that radical gift. That was the widow's might, M-I-G-H-T. That is where her strength, her power, her might came from. And because of that, she was able to give up her might, M-I-T-E. I'd like to share just a quick personal story with you. This story has long, long, long been a favorite of mine. And when I saw this in the lectionary, I got excited, as only a preacher can probably do. Because I have often thought about the widow in her mind. For several years, every time we go to New Orleans, there's a store there that sells antique guns and knives and coins and everything you can think of. You know, West Indies, sabers, and you name it, and they've got it. But in, a, in the counter there, under glass, they have a collection of widow's mites. And every time we would go, I would go in and I'd look at them and I'd ask to see it and I'd hold it in my hand. And I would play this story out in my head. And I would almost come to tears thinking, now the chances are remote, but what if that was the widow's mite? And I would look at them and I, I would think how beautiful that little grimy piece of copper is. But I would put it back in the counter because I said there is no way that I will spend that kind of money on something so simple and small. And so every year we would go in there and I would look at them. Well, last March when we were in New Orleans, we went back to that shop. And we went in, of course, and I went straight to the counter. And I asked to see it, and they got it out, and George said, well, we're going to buy it this year, and I said, no, 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 you know, that's silly, it's too much money, and he said, this will be your graduation gift, because, of course, I graduated in May with my Master's of Divinity from seminary, and I thought, well, you know, that's okay, because to me, that small piece of copper showed the power and the might that God has. And the power and might that God had moved and done and shown in my life. And because of that, the power and the might that I had to share with others. So here's the widow's might. Little bitty piece of dirty copper. Imagine this. Being the offering and the might that is behind it. Amen.
gracious God, you are the giver of all good gifts. Help us to develop the sense of might and power and the trust that we can find in you. Accept these gifts given with the heart of the widow. the widow. 